Good morning, Hershey Free Church family. I'm so glad that we can gather again this morning and worship. My name is Deb Hinkle, and I'd like to introduce you to my two awesome grandchildren. I'm Sarah. And I'm Noah. Even though we are meeting online and not in a building, we can still accomplish our goal at Hershey Free Church to live with Jesus, love like Jesus, and lead others to do the same. We can accomplish this mission even in our homes. This is a time of year where members of our congregation vote on new leaders for our deacon and elder boards, as well as the budget. This year's congregational meeting will look a little bit different. This year's congregational meeting will take place today, Sunday, June 14th at 4 p.m. and will be on Zoom. Information about the budget and new leaders, as well as the Zoom link, can be found at hfcinfo.com. We as staff and elders have prayerfully and proactively been considering how we can put in a plan in place for a safe reentry to begin to meet in person again at the church. But we want to do this in a responsible way, even as we are eager to again meet together. Information about guidelines, uh, times for the church and dates when we can meet, cleaning procedures, and what to expect for an in-person gathering are available at hfcinfo.com. We also want to thank you for your continued financial support. You can continue to give by going to hfcinfo.com by texting or mailing your check to the church. And thank you again for your continued giving. And now let us worship together with resilient joy. Good morning, Hershey Free. It's great to be with you this morning. Let's prepare our hearts and minds in Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. So let's sing praise and lift up his name this morning.
worship him in humbleness oh praise him for the last couple of weeks and it was on my heart in the beginning of just this God of revival and I didn't know that today and in this season this song would just speak so true and for a little while I was wondering why it just God wasn't moving and you know that God works just in ways that we can't always see but in the past the church, the church responded. God worked in revival when the church humbled itself before God, when scales fell, fell from eyes and people could see what they were in in the wrong. And in this season, that's just, that's where God has led me. Of the things that I haven't seen, and how I've been in the wrong. And so we confess the confess our sins before God and open up that the church would be where justice flows like waters and righteousness would roll. Not that we would just come in and sing these songs and God would work, but humbling ourselves and confessing so let's sing this song that God breaks down these walls, breaks down these barriers, because we need it. Let's sing this song too. i 
knees in awe In the heartbeat of my life Is to worship in your life Cause your glory is so beautiful Cause your glory is so beautiful
Hey everyone, thanks again for joining this online service of our church. I'm gonna thank you for being a part of this today. If you got a Bible, I'm gonna invite you to join with me in turning to Philippians chapter two. And by the way, just a reminder, uh, you will find the sermon notes at hfcinfo.com. So I would encourage you to check that out. If you'd like to see the passages or anything else related to the sermon, you can find it there. I'm not sure if you, I'm not sure if you saw this this week, but there was a, a major poll released by a prominent news service. And one of the polling questions really drew my attention because they had, they had asked people this question. Things in our country are out of control or under control? Now, as you think about that polling question, just think for a moment about all the things going on in, in our country. Right, I mean, for the last few months, we've been dealing with this pandemic, COVID-19, and we're not really sure what that's going to look like moving forward and when a virus or you know, an antidote may be developed. Likewise, more recently, we've been reminded of the issues of race and injustice, and we're wrestling with how to deal with these issues. And, and in some ways, on both of these issues, our, our country is divided. Furthermore, We've got a contentious election coming up. In fact, I think this may be one of the most contentious elections that we've seen in recent history. So with all of that in mind, how, where would you respond? Would you say things in our country are kind of out of control or they are under control? How would you respond to that question? It's probably not going to surprise you that the majority of people said things, things feel like they're out of control. 80% and 15 said they're under control. I'm not sure about the other. 5%. And, and if, you, if, you know, if you can relate to this, if you kind of relate to the sense that wow, things really do feel a bit out of control culturally right now, I think it's, it's more natural in these circumstances for us to, to have maybe a, a greater sense of frustration, a greater sense of maybe of being tired, even a greater sense of anger. I think for some of us, it's, it's pretty easy for us to get angry with people on some of these issues that disagree with us or think differently than we do. Likewise, I don't, I don't know if you notice this in your own life, but I've, I've discovered over the last few weeks, it's, it's easier for me sometimes to get irritated with people. And, and I've just had to catch myself at some point. And if you can relate to that at all, then, then I think what we're going to look at in Philippians chapter 2 is particularly important for all of us. This morning, we're continuing our journey through Philippians, where Paul is encouraging us to develop a resilient joy. And as we come to Philippians chapter 2, here's what he's going to call the church to. He's going to call the church to unity. And particularly in, in light of what we're going through now, I think this is a message that we need to hear. Now, as we learned last week, at the end of chapter 1, Paul says, look, I want you to remember this one thing. I want you to live a life worthy of the gospel. Now, as he continues to develop that idea, he says, Here, here's what I want you to work toward. I want you to work towards unity as a church. And so that brings us to the opening verses of, of chapter 2. And here's Paul's call to unity. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. So there's this call to unity that Paul gives us. And notice when he says, you know, if you have any encouragement or if you have any comfort, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, when he's saying these things, his assumption is, well, of course you do. These are the resources that you have as, as a follower of Christ, as someone who is in Christ. And so as he tells them about these resources, Paul also says, I want you to be united. Now, why would, why would Paul have to give the church this challenge? I think, I think the answer to that is, is pretty simple. He, he had to give the church this challenge because, you see, the gospel brings different people together. It brings different types of people together. Undoubtedly, there were some in this church who had the status of Roman citizenship, but there were others who were from a much lower social status and who came at life very differently. Uh, most of this church would have been Gentile, but there were still some in the church, it's clear, that were saying we need to follow certain Jewish customs and, and Jewish practices. 
Furthermore, we see in this, is this book that there was some kind of division in, in the church that's described in chapter four. So for all sorts of reasons, Paul feels it necessary to remind the church, look guys, we need to work together. You need to work together. And you know, I think likewise, as a church, we need to understand as a church family that, that the gospel brings different kinds of people together. From, from different backgrounds, different stages of life, different perspectives. And I think that's particularly true in our circumstances. For instance, I think it's particularly true now as we prepare to go through this election. Because some of us are going to come at these national issues from very different perspectives and from very different angles. In fact, you may be interested to know one of the things I'm reading right now, one of the Books I'm reading is, is this one that's just come out. It's called, How Can I Love Church Members with Different Politics? And, and some of you maybe are thinking, well, I need to order that on Amazon. Let me get the title of that. So, so in the midst of this potential division, Paul says, I want you to work together. I mean, even as our culture can be divided, even as our church can be divided, Paul was, was writing a church with its own issues. So he says, look, I want you to work together. I want you to be united. And the question is, well, well so how exactly do you do that? <laughs> what's the case, Paul? I mean, what's the key, Paul? How do we, how do we, how do we put this into practice? And he, he really tells us the key is the passage continues. The key comes as, as Paul continues to write. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, notice this, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. So here's what, here's what Paul is saying. Look, I want you guys to work on unity and building unity, but for that to take place, you've got to develop a certain mindset. You've got to develop a certain attitude, and that attitude has to be rooted, rooted in humility. Now, um, this may not seem surprising to us, but this was radical and revolutionary to the first people who received this letter. Because remember, this is the church in Philippi. Philippi is a Roman colony steeped in Roman culture. And in Roman culture, when you kind of sat around, when you talked about, you know, admirable qualities and, and virtues that people admired, nobody talked about humility. Humility wasn't valued in this culture. It, it was despised. In the Roman world, the value that was highly regarded was the pursuit of honor. And the pursuit of honor was all about, all about proving yourself to be better than other people. In fact, when Paul says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, what he is doing, he is taking, he's taking the values of Roman culture and, and turning them upside down. In essence, he's saying, look, I know this is the way you've been brought up. I know this is the value that permeates your world, but, but I want to turn it on its head and, and I want to challenge you to live a life of humility, a life that moves you beyond yourself, a life of service. And for those in this church, this, this had to be, it, it had to be a challenging message to hear. But what about us? I mean, when you see Paul talking about humility, what, what do you think about? What comes to your mind when you think about humility? Some of us are, are watching this with our families, and, and I hope you have some conversation after the service. And maybe one question that might get you started would be this. What, is, what does humility look like in our family? I mean, just kind of go around the room for a moment. Okay, so, so let's think about our life as family. So what does humility look like in our family? I encourage you to have that conversation. Now, if we're going to unpack what Paul is getting at as he challenges this church and he challenges us to humility, uh, maybe a good place to start is, is by acknowledging what humility is not. Let me just mention a couple of things so that we don't get confused when we think about humility. First of all, humility is not low self-esteem. I think sometimes people have the idea, well, you know, to be humble means you're always critical of yourself. You're always putting yourself down. You can never take a compliment. And, and you know, the more I put myself down, the more humble I am. That's, that's what humility is. 
However, remember the way Paul starts this section. Do you remember how he started it? He talked about all these resources that we have in Christ. He talked about love and encouragement and kind of the strength and comfort that that comes from being in Christ. That's who we are now. So I, I don't think humility is about putting yourself down. Humility is not about being a doormat. Here's another thing humility is not. Humility is not a lack of ambition. I think for some people, the, the assumption is, well, if you're ambitious, you're not humble. So you can't be ambitious because that shows a lack of humility. But if that's how you, how you think, I mean, just look at the life of the Apostle Paul. In so many ways, his life is characterized by ambition. He's always moving forward. He talks in this book about kind of pursuing that goal that God has set before him. And, and that's the way he talks about his life. If you were to meet him one-on-one, -on -one, you would come up with, this guy's he's got drive. There's ambition here. So if, if you would say, I'm an ambitious person, there's, there's no need to feel guilty about that. The question is not whether or not we should be ambitious. The question is, what's, what's the focus of that ambition? Is my, is my ambition simply self-focused, or, or is it focused on fulfilling my, my purpose as part of God's bigger plan of living beyond myself? So humility is not a lack of ambition. And thirdly, I would say this. Humility is not all about downplaying our accomplishments. This week, in getting ready for this message, I came across a reference to one dad, and this dad had chosen in his life never to compliment his kids or never to tell them that he was proud of them. And the reason was this, he wanted them to develop humility. But is, is that really what humility is about? I mean, interestingly, even as you read this book, you get to the, the latter part of chapter two, which we'll come to next week, and you, you see Paul has no problem complimenting and, and mentioning the strengths of his colleagues. Furthermore, really later in the book, he's willing to talk about, I think, his own strengths as well. So humility really isn't about these things. It's not about low self-esteem. It's not about lack of ambition. It's not about downplaying our accomplishments. So if, if it's not these things, what exactly is it? Well, here's one way to think about humility. It's not self-deprecation. It's self-awareness before a holy God. It's our, our self-awareness before a holy God. It's not about putting myself down. It's about seeing myself in Christ. Seeing that through the work of, of the gospel and the work now of God's spirit, I've been brought into a new relationship with God or a relationship where I'm being empowered and equipped to love and serve God and love and serve other people. I'm, I'm being brought into a way of life that is to move me beyond myself and move me in service to others. It moves me in an outward direction. So Paul says, look, I want you to be united, but for you to be united, you've, you've got to become people who have a mindset of humility, a mindset that moves you into a way of life, of, of serving one another. And, and I think at this point, maybe the, the natural question that we would ask Paul is this, okay, Paul, I'm starting to get what you're saying, but, but what does this look like? Can you, can you give me an example? And you know what? That's exactly what Paul does. What does this look like? Well, as you continue in the passage, he now, he now moves to the example of Jesus Christ. And as we come to uh, kind of this part of the passage, really beginning in verse 5, we come to one of the most significant parts of the Bible in describing the person and work of Jesus Christ. In fact, I would encourage you to be in the habit of highlighting your Bible, and this is a passage that you need to highlight. Paul says, look, I've been telling you about humility. Let me show you what it looks like, and I'm going to show you what it looks like by reminding you of the person and work of Christ. Paul says this, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset, right? This is the mindset that I want you to develop as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, 
that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. Now, let me just highlight a couple of things from this passage for you very briefly. Paul says, look, I want you to develop humility, this mindset, and I want you to see this in operation in, in the life of Jesus Christ. And notice what he says about Christ. First, first, he highlights Christ's deity, right? Christ is in very nature God, and he highlights the idea of equality with God. <laughs> but then he says this, as he's talking about Jesus' status, he says, this was not something that he used to his own advantage. It's, a, it's an interesting term there. Think about this. If, for those of us who are parents, if you've had small kids, at some point you may have found yourself having to intervene in, in, a, in a crisis or in a conflict because two kids are fighting over a toy. And here are two kids sitting on the ground and one of them is clutching this toy with a death grip. It's mine, it's mine, it's mine. You can't have it, it's mine. And you kind of have to intervene. And it, it requires all of your parenting skill at that point. And, that's this idea of using to his own advantage. In other words, the status, the uniqueness of Christ was not something that he held on tightly just to say, this is mine, this is mine, this is mine. Rather, instead, he made himself nothing. This phrase actually translates one, one word in Greek, and it's, it's a word that's generated a lot of conversation because the, the, the idea here is, is the idea of emptying. So you'll see some translations, in essence, say he emptied himself. And of course, that's led to a lot of conversation. What does that, what does that mean, he emptied himself? Well, it doesn't mean that he gave up his deity, but what, he, what it does mean is he gave up his status, his rights, his privileges. And he did that by, by becoming like us, by becoming human, right? He, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human lightness. It's a reference to the incarnation of Christ becoming human. It's a reference to the author entering the story. It's a reference to the creator entering his creation. But notice that he doesn't simply become like us. He also dies for us. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And so notice what Paul is saying here. Here's what humility looks like. I've been talking to you about humility. Well, look at what it looks like in the life of Christ. He doesn't use his status, his privilege for his own advantage. Instead, he serves by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. And consequently, as a result, God exalted him to the highest place and gives him the name that is above every name. It's an affirmation that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now, as we've gone through this passage, notice particularly that as Paul described Jesus' death, he emphasized the fact that Jesus does this willingly. He was obedient to death. In other words, Jesus' death was not an instance of tragic circumstances overwhelming a particular individual. It wasn't the case of simply being you know, overwhelmed by the Roman political authorities. No, Jesus chose it willingly. He was obedient. He chooses the path of humility. John Dixon is an ancient historian who's done a helpful book on humility, and he says this, humility is the noble choice to forego your status, to deploy your resources or use your influence for the good of others before yourself. And you know, that's exactly what Paul is describing in this passage. Jesus chose not to hold on to his status and his privilege in such a selfless way. He becomes like us so that he deploys his resources for our good. And now Paul says, you know what? I want you to do the same. This is the attitude, the mindset that I want you to develop. So now let's just kind of see if we can put the pieces of this passage together since we've kind of looked at it in different sections. Remember, Paul started by saying, look, I'm calling you to unity. It's so easy for you to be divided, but I'm calling you to unity. And he, as he calls them to unity, he reminds them of the resources that they have in Jesus as followers of Jesus. And he says to, to develop this unity, you've got to act out of an attitude of humility. And ultimately what that means is taking the resources that God has given you and using them in service 
to other people. Now, all of that leads really to one final question, and that is this. So where do I start? How, how, do I, how do I really embrace what Paul is talking about? How do I take it seriously? Well, you know, at this point, I think it would be easy for me to close and say, okay, now I want you to go out this week and uh, every day remind yourself you need to be humble. And so tomorrow you could get up, you could go out and remind yourself to be humble at the beginning of the day. And depending on where, how you did, at the end of the day, you would either maybe feel really proud about how well you did or you'd feel guilty. And the truth is, if we just talk about focusing on humility, that doesn't necessarily develop humility. In fact, I would say this, we don't develop humility by focusing on humility, we, we develop humility by focusing on Jesus. And so here's, here's where I would really challenge you to, you to think. I would challenge you to focus on Christ and live in the flow of his grace. Focus on Christ and live in the flow of his grace. A foundational antidote to the pride that can take root in our lives is reminding ourselves that Jesus is Lord. And really, in a real sense, this passage kind of builds to an affirmation of who Jesus is. I mean, when I'm developing a condescending attitude because of other people who might disagree with me, I need to remind myself, Jesus is Lord. When I'm resting in my sense of self-sufficiency and, and accomplishment, I need to remind myself Jesus is Lord. When I'm so focused on my situation that I can't see beyond myself, I need to remind myself Jesus is Lord. And as, as we remind ourselves of who Christ is, we, we need to remind ourselves that he intends for us to live in the flow of his grace. Now, here's what I mean by that. You see, in different ways, his, his grace is at work in our lives as followers of Jesus. Through his word, through his spirit, through biblical friendships and conversations, through different circumstances, through the resources that he has placed in our lives. But his intent in, in his grace is not simply that that grace be at work in us. His intent that that grace is, is to work through us. And you know what? This happens in all sorts of ways. It happens as we encourage others as we build into relationships. It happens as we serve, as we give. It happens as we are part of biblical community. And some of you have experienced that in meaningful ways in the life of our church. It happens through prayer. There are all sorts of ways that God's grace can work through us into the lives of other people. For instance, just this week, there's, there's an individual in our church who had to go out of town for some very serious medical treatment. Um, because of a severe medical condition. And, and the night before he left, there were people from our church. They, we just gathered in his front yard and we prayed. And in a real sense, that was a group of people living in the flow of God's grace through the gift of prayer, the gift of friendship. And living in the flow of God's grace is the path of humility. So as a church, can we just... Right now, just embrace this invitation that Paul is giving us. Particularly in this cultural moment where it seems so easily for us to be divided culturally. And particularly in a moment where I think it can be so easy for us to be divided as a church. Can we embrace Paul's challenge to be united? With so many things that can divide us, with so many things that can distract us. Can we embrace the truth that right now there are resources in our lives that God is giving us the opportunity to use in the lives of other people? Right now, as a church community, even as we're scattered, can we agree together that we want to focus on Christ and live in the flow of his grace? Let's pray together. Gracious God, as we come to this passage that challenges us to this way of humility, I pray that, first of all, you would remind us of the example of Christ. Remind us of the, the work of the gospel, your work on our behalf, your work of grace, of his sacrifice on our behalf, and, 
and the reality that through faith we have entered this new relationship. But now as part of this new relationship, now your grace not only is to be at work in us, but it is to flow into the lives of other people. And Father, as we embrace that, that, that way of life becomes the path of humility. May that truth just encourage us and challenge us and motivate us this week. In Jesus' name, amen.
you see no other name Jesus Jesus my heart will sing no other name Jesus Jesus Amen Again, I want to thank you for joining us for this online service. By the way, if you're watching on Sunday mornings, I'd love the opportunity to have a conversation with you. So please note, you'll find on the page you're viewing opportunities to jump into a Zoom chat after both the 9 and 1030 services. So I look forward to talking with you online. Now, church, as we begin a new week, can we embrace this challenge together to focus on Christ and to live in the flow of his grace?